Amen. All right. So we're going to jump into the message now. And uh, I have a very important announcement to make. Make sure you're, you're focused. Is um, I tied my shoes in double knots today. Okay? Because I know how distracting that was. I, I was seriously, like, after Sunday, I was like, did I speak Chinese on Sunday? I mean, because, like, I don't feel like anyone was connecting with what I was saying. And anyway, I listened to uh, my message on Monday to make sure, okay, I wasn't speaking in tongues or Chinese because I didn't feel like, I mean, what I realized was, oh, my shoelace came untied and it was flopping around and people were like really worried if I was going to trip and fall or, you know, probably you're 30 minutes in, you're like, man, is he going to trip? Is he going to fall? So Anyway, I tied my shoes in double knots. So now you have no excuse not to be focused, all right? I'm kidding, just, just kidding with you. But um, we're in this series right now called In the Day of, or called The Day of His Power. We're walking through Psalm 110. We're walking through Revelation 12, Revelation 14, Revelation 7, Revelation 11. And the title of this message is Revelation 12, Part 2. We're, we're going into a lot of detail. We're going verse by verse through Revelation 12, verse by verse through Revelation 14, verse by verse through Revelation 7, um, just to really get a really uh, strong found, scriptural foundation of these chapters, which are of vital importance to the hour we live in. We live in, in such an urgent time, like we were singing about, the need to prepare the way. And so let's start now with Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, because a lot of times, and just this, this comes just from teaching the book of Revelation, a lot of times when we get to the book of Revelation, what I find is people really love the book of Revelation, or they don't love the book of Revelation. There's not really a lot of middle ground here. They either like, I hate this book, or they probably would never say that. They would more say, yeah, I'm not really into it, but they don't really like it because what's revealed. When there's other people like me who just love this book, and that's all we want, we'll just let's talk about the book of Revelation. So if you're one of those kind of like not really into the book of Revelation, I want to just introduce this to you. Of the reason why to read this book is uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, is John says, Blessed is he who reads... So just stop, stop right there and just realize God will spiritually bless you just by reading the book of Revelation. Well, I don't understand what it means. I don't get all the symbols and the symbolism and all the confusing things. Or some of it's just depressing. I don't like all the things of destruction that's coming and all the different symbols and signs of demonic and all that. I don't get all that. And the Lord says, if you read it, I will bless you. And I have seen this in my own life. If I will read the book of Revelation, I come into spiritual blessings that are unlike any other book in the Bible. I believe that's true. And I say that from experience. When you come into the book of Revelation and you read the book of Revelation, I believe the Father has pronounced a blessing on this book that for those who, and he said it right here, for those who read it, they will be blessed. So if you feel like I'm dry, I'm stagnant in my relationship with God, I'm stuck, if you will read the book of Revelation, God promises you he will bless you. Now he also promises a blessing to those who hear the words of the prophecy. That would be um, hearing it from a speaker such as myself, that if you will pay attention and not get distracted by the shoelaces dangling. Hopefully they won't dangle. But any other distraction, if you will stay focused and hear what is being said, you will experience a blessing. You will experience a, a spiritual blessing. Now here's where you really get blessed is if this is where you, you will be blessed for all eternity if you heed or obey what is written in it. That's where the rubber meets the road is will you obey, not just hear, not just listen, or read, but will you obey? Will you obey what the Lord is saying in this book? If you, will you heed the things which are written in it for the time is near? Obedience. Okay, so let's look at now Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. This is going to be the text we're going to 
drill in on today in, our, in this message. We're going to go deep in this. So uh, I'm going to read it and then we'll explain it and we'll go deeper into it. But in Revelation 12, 1, John sees a vision and he says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Verse 2. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain, to give birth. Okay, now we're going to, you might, how are you going to fill in a whole hour talking about that? Trust me, there's a lot in there. We're going to dive into that. But let me just tell you, first of all, I'm going to say this probably repeatedly. I'm going to reiterate this over and over and over just so it sinks in. Why is this series so important? And I said this last Sunday, I'm going to say it again, because I want it to really get into us. I want it to sink into us. Is this series as important as because we are living in the end times? We are living in the end times. We are, I don't know exactly how many years it is until the Lord actually returns, but we are living in that hour. I mean, the birth pains are definitely increasing. So we are living in that hour, and this prophecy, Revelation chapter 12 especially, is critical. But what I've found is that most people do not understand Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 is, in my opinion, the most important unfulfilled prophecy, yet it is the least understood prophecy, in my opinion, and the most misinterpreted prophecy, in my opinion. And it's of utmost importance that we gain the revelation of what the Lord was speaking in Revelation chapter 12 so that we can become what God's looking for in this hour. Because as we're going to see in this message, Revelation chapter 12, and especially in verses 1 and 2, reveals God's thought, God's full thought for the church. It reveals what God wants for the church. It reveals uh, the church as God sees the end from the beginning, but it's not really revealing her true condition, but God will make sure that happens before the Lord comes back. And so th this prophecy is important because Revelation chapter 12 is the catalytic event. It's like a trigger. It pulls the trigger to the gun, so to speak, of God's end time events Revelation chapter 12 is the catalytic event, it's the trigger event that makes the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in history come to pass. Joel chapter 2 is going to be fulfilled. Joel chapter 2 was not completely fulfilled in the book of Acts. Joel, the book of Acts was only a first fruits, early reign experience of Joel chapter 2. And you can read Joel chapter 2 and see the context of it. It's before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. I'm telling you, before the Lord comes back, the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in history is coming. And it's coming upon an army in the day of God's power who has become a free will offering and said, Yes, Lord, we surrender to you. We want to be your bondservant. And so what we see here in, in this, this, Revelation chapter 12, is Revelation chapter 12 is telling us of the wineskin. Jesus talked about that, is God will not pour new wine into an old wineskin because the wineskin will burst and the, and the wine will spill out. So what God, want, what God must have before he pours out the new wine of the Spirit of God for this last hour, he, sa he has saved his best wine for last, is the Lord must have a wineskin that's comprised of overcomers. Those who have come into the full maturity of Jesus Christ. Those who have overcome what Jesus said in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. Those who have overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those who of it is written in, in Revelation 12 10, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even unto death. They've come into this reality where their flesh is going to the cross and experiencing the death of the cross. So the Spirit of God in them rises up, and the Spirit of God 
owns them and possesses them, and they are the sons of God who are led by the Spirit of God. That's the wineskin. God needs to pour out the new the, the, the wine he has saved for last, according to Joel chapter 2, where there will be the greatest move of prophecy and power and authority that the world has ever witnessed. I believe it will be greater than the book of Acts. I believe it will be greater than what Moses experienced with Pharaoh and releasing plagues. It will have the greatest authority and the greatest power through an army that is his wineskin in the day of power. So we are living in incredible times, okay? I know if you look out and you listen to the news or watch, look on social media, I mean, social media is just a conglomeration of just insanity rolled into one package, okay? I still get on there, but that's probably why I'm anxious all the time. I'm kidding. I'm not. But it's just, you, you just get this picture of where the world is, and it almost seems like this is such negativity, but I'm telling you, the great, it's, it's the greatest hour to be alive if you're a believer, if you're going to say yes to the Lord. If you're going to live in compromise, it's not so great. But if you're going to say yes to the Lord, God's power is coming upon an army that he is going to use this army to shake the world with the greatest demonstration of power and authority that the world has ever seen. But the power will not be her message. Jesus will be her message. Jesus will be the message. One testimony that we heard as Dad was talking is one of our leaders, Evans, and um, Evan Souza in Kenya was, you know, and, and if you've been to Africa, you know, every, the whole message, everything is about signs and wonders, signs and wonders, healing, miracles, signs and wonders, prosperity. It's all always, that is the message. And... Um, Evans was, had high blood pressure, and he was reading the eternal blueprint, which talks about God's eternal purpose, and ultimately God's eternal, eternal purpose in Christ, and getting that message into his heart. And Evans was telling Dad that all of a sudden he was reading the eternal blueprint, and out of nowhere he felt this like cool uh, feeling wash of like water. I'm may, maybe not getting it exactly right, but water come within him. It was almost like this feeling of cool water come within him, and he felt as if he was healed of his high blood pressure. And then he went and asked the two doctors, and two doctors both verified he was healed. So my point is this, this army of power, power and miracles are not going to be the message. Christ will be the message. Christ will be the focus, not signs. We've seen that what the church looks like. When the, church focuses, when the church focuses on signs, wonders, and miracles, it gets way out of balance because signs, wonders, and miracles are never meant to be the message. Christ is always meant to be the message. And so God is forming a wineskin through whom he can pour out the greatest outpouring of the Spirit in history. This will lead to this army being released of messengers, apostolic and prophetic voices, evangelists, teachers, the greatest uh, explosion of fivefold ministry in the day of God's power who will be equipped with the eternal gospel in Revelation 14, 6. And they will be given that eternal gospel to preach into every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And then we see in Revelation chapter 7, coming up from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation is a number that's too great to count. They come up and they've washed their robes and they made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And, and so with this eternal gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of God, like Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness, and then the end will come. Revelation chapter 12 makes that possible, okay? So this is why we're spending so much time. Why are we spending so much time? Because of the importance of that. Revelation 12 is the catalyst that triggers the great tribulation and the day of the Lord. I'm learning, and I should learn, I should have known this, but I'm learning. Revelation chapter 12 is one of the devil's least favorite chapters in the Bible. It talks about his fall from the second heaven to the earth, which ultimately will become to the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 20 for a thousand years, and then ultimately into the eternal fire forever. He does not like Revelation chapter 12. And those who preach Revelation chapter 12, he's not real happy about. So you can be praying for me. 
I'm just saying that. This is, this is, this, there's, there's conflict. There's spiritual conflict around this message. And I'm not saying that to make you feel sorry for me. I'm just saying be aware. Be aware of the, of the spiritual dynamics at work in this message because the devil hates it. God loves it. And let's be people that are on God's side that say, I love this. I love what you're doing, Lord. But Revelation 12 is the trigger event for the great tribulation, which is the last three and a half years of the age, and the day of the Lord, which are, in my opinion, are basically synonymous. Uh, the second coming of Christ hinges upon Revelation chapter 12. Without Revelation 12 being fulfilled, the Lord delay, the Lord's return would be continued to be delayed. Well, that goes against our theology. That goes against our idea that Jesus is coming back and it has nothing to do with the church's response. It's just a sovereign thing God does. I talked about this last Sunday, but no, Peter said that we can accelerate, we can hasten the day of his coming. So Revelation chapter 12 talks about what it means when the church accelerates that day. God has a sovereign role to play, absolutely, but we have also a major role to play. God will not fulfill our part, and we can't do God's. But we got to find this place where we say, okay, Lord, what is it you're calling the church to do? He's calling us to overcome. And then Revelation chapter 12 reveals all of this, and the millennial kingdom also hinges upon Revelation chapter 12. Okay, wouldn't you say that's important? <laughs> wouldn't you say that's worthy of us to spend line upon line uh, going through this in great detail to give understanding? Because if, I'm, if what I'm saying is true, and if the church has so little understanding, what do we need? We desperately need understanding. That's why we're going to go line by line, verse by verse through this teaching. Okay, so let me show the first slide here. I got some slides to show here. Is just the importance of rightly interpreting the book of Revelation. Um, a scholar, a theologian named Charles Bing said that small distinctions can make a big difference. Consider the difference between a letter can make. The letter A turns a, th a theist into an atheist and someone who is moral into someone who is not or amoral. One letter, A, turns a theist into an atheist, turns someone who's moral into someone who's amoral. My point in this is it, and when, when interpreting the book of Revelation, one tiny little letter, one tiny little interpretation, one way we interpret something has massive implications, massive ramifications to our understanding. Therefore, it's so very, very important that we, uh, we understand this. Mark Twain said that the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. Okay, again, my point is getting that right interpretation, getting the right interpretation makes a huge difference. Whether we interpret something allegorically, metaphorically, or literally makes a huge difference in how we read the book of Revelation. Okay, so the difference, another, the, the next slide, the difference between interpreting a symbolic vision as a literal future event versus a metaphorical spiritual representation can lead to a vast different, a vastly different theological conclusion. Okay, that's big words, but it basically means we, get, we have to be very, very careful about how we interpret the book of Revelation. And there's, there's some more about this in the notes. I'll, I'll kind of uh, move on from here. But th this is a, a real way, a real easy way to think about it is when the plain sense, when the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. So when you're reading Revelation, and it makes sense, the plain sense makes sense, then don't seek any other sense. When John sees, or when, yeah, when John sees seven lampstands, okay, well, it's seven churches. That makes perfect sense. These seven lampstands, seven, seven is the literal representation of the seven churches. It's not, seven heads doesn't carry a symbolic meaning there, it just means seven, he saw seven churches. But 
um, when, when John was taken up into the throne room and he saw he was caught up to God into his throne. That is not spirit, that is not a, a spiritual or metaphorical experience. He literally was translated spiritually from his feet were still on Patmos where he was in prison, but his spirit was raised up into the uh, third heaven where God dwells and he was before the throne of God and beheld spiritually God before the throne. That was literal and that should be interpreted literally. But when we come to Revelation chapter 12, that is perhaps the most metaphorical, symbolic chapter in the book of Revelation and therefore we've got to proceed with a lot of caution to say, okay, does this mean we need to interpret it literally? Does this mean we need to interpret it uh, metaphorically or symbolically? Or is there some kind of balance here? And you'll find, as we'll see, there are times in, when we go into Revelation chapter 12, some things should be interpreted symbolically as representative. Other things are literal. Like, for example, the 1,260 days, that's literally three and a half years. The, the warfare that's going to take place in the heavens, that's literally... Um, literal warfare that's going to take place. But the woman is a representative of, I'm going to show you the church. The dragon is representative of Satan. So uh, the woman goes into the wilderness. I don't think she actually goes into a sandy desert. I think she is just is representative of a place of refuge. So when we interpret the book of Revelation, we must keep in mind this tension between the literal and the symbolic to arrive at God's understanding of this book. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we're going to move, and I'm just going to go through this, this part pretty quick. Is um, Let's show the slide of the, uh, the order of the book of Revelation 12 through 14. Um, this really helps me. Um, I hope this helps you. This is, I kind of think about this. When you understand uh, Revelation 12 through 14, when it takes place, and how the different passages fit together in the chronological order, it helps you put order into these things. And so I want to encourage you, read Revelation 12 through 14 and use these, these pictures as a guideline of reading it. Re instead of just reading Revelation 12 all the way through, Revelation 13 all the way through, and then Revelation 14 all the way through, I want to encourage you to read as I'm, I'm laying out here in this, in this picture, and it gives you a different picture. It gives you, and this is the, what I believe is actually the chronological order of these things. Um, and so what you see here in this first slide is you see Revelation chapter 12, 1 through 4, taking place uh, just prior. In reality, this is not to scale because I had to fit some other things in here. But it's, this is just prior to the midpoint of the tribulation or the start of the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of the age. Revelation 12, 1 through 4 is taking place just prior to the last three and a half years. So the, when John sees the woman, she's clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, the crown on her head is a crown of 12 stars. This is taking place just prior to the last three and a half years. Okay, it's a catalytic event. Okay, the next slide here is going to show us Revelation 12, 5 is also taking a place right before the Great Tribulation, right before the start of the Great Tribulation. And I made it long here because there's other events that are, that are, that are the result of this, this sun, this mature sun, picture a 25-year-old coming out of the womb. It's not like a baby. It's a 25-year-old man coming out of the womb and in full maturity. That's the picture we're getting in Revelation chapter 12 by the word son. It's weos, ready to inherit maturity. And this, when this mature son comes and is, is birthed through the woman, born through the woman, that unleashes a number of other events. So that's why... Revelation 12, 1 through 4 leads to Revelation 12, 5, which then leads, and we'll show you the, the next slide here, is that leads to Revelation, it doesn't lead to, it doesn't immediately lead to Revelation 12, 6. That's how it reads in, in the scriptures. But it actually leads immediately to Revelation 7, 1 through 12, or Revelation 7 through 12. That, that's a little bit of a, it can throw people off, but you'll, you'll see as I get into this more, that'll make more sense to you. 
The, when, the, when the son is born, when that, when that, what some have called the man child is born, when this mature son is born, that's when the war takes place in the heavens, Revelation 7, or Revelation 12, 7 through 12. And then at that same time, when that war is taking place, John would see at that same timeline, Revelation 14, 1 through 5, the 144,000, which as I'm going to explain and I'm going to show you in detail, I believe that the child that's born, this overcoming son that's born, is the 144,000 in Revelation 14, 1 through 5. So I believe it's the same, and I'll, I'll prove it to you um, so you can see it, but I'm just laying it out there so you can understand that. And then the next slide here is... The, the war that takes place in heaven leads to Satan and his angels cast down through the earth, which then leads to Revelation chapter 13, which is when the Antichrist has a reign on the earth for 42 months, the last three and a half years of the age. Some people think, okay, that the, the 1,260 days and the 42 months and stuff are, are different time periods. I think it's the exact same time period, just stated in a different way. Um, it, it's the same time period. It's that last three and a half years of the age that is being pointed out. So Revelation 13 happens after the war takes place in heaven. And Revelation 14, 6 through 20, when the harvest is reaped, takes place after the 144,000 have come into the fullness of what is being shown here into this overcoming place. And they are given the eternal gospel to preach um, as, an, as an army in the day of God's power to preach to all the nations and then that harvest is reaped. So that's, that's what you're seeing here in uh, the outline here. And then finally, finally, we get to, uh, we get to um, the last slide is Revelation, Revelation 12, 13 through 18, when the woman is running into the wilderness. And I, I forgot to mention on that slide, it should also show verse 12, 6. So I made a mistake there. But 12, 6, and comma, 13 through 18, shows when the woman is fleeing and she's running into the wilderness because the dragon has come down. And if the dragon, whether he possesses or whether he's just in union with the Antichrist, it's through the Antichrist regime the woman flees into the wilderness and God gives her a place of refuge. Okay. All that said, that's a mouthful. I realize that's a, that's a ton of information. So come back. Okay. You can study that on your own. And I would encourage you to study that on your own and ask God to give you insight. But now, let's, let's now shift back and we're going to show, uh, we're going to walk through starting with Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation 12, 1. Okay. John sees a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, this is a bit confusing because the woman is actually on the earth, even though John sees her in heaven. I'm going to explain this for in a second, but verse uh, 12 and 6 and 13 through 17 make it very clear the woman is not in heaven. She's on, she's, the woman is on the earth, but John sees her in heaven. Now, what we need to understand here is heaven here is not talking about the third heaven where God and where the Father and the Son dwell, where the angels dwell, where the throne of God is. Heaven here is talking about the spiritual realm. Okay, well, how do you know that? Because that's where the dragon is. Where did Paul say the, dra where did Paul say the spiritual warfare is taking place? In heavenly places. Okay, so what, what John is seeing here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, he's, he's seeing the woman in the spiritual realm, not in the third heaven where God dwells, but in, um, you, and you can see this in the book of Ephesians where Paul mentions the heavenly places, I think five or six times in the book of Ephesians, he's really talking about the spiritual realm, not the third heaven. So, when Paul was taken to heaven, he called it the third heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, I was caught up to the third heaven. Okay, so some people have called the spiritual realm the second heaven. Um, and that's, that's what we're seeing right here is, is John is seeing the woman not in the third heaven. 
He's seeing the woman in the second heaven or in the spiritual realm. Does that make sense? So, so in other words, the woman is literally on earth, but, but John is seeing her in a vision in the spiritual realm because she's in spiritual warfare. Does that make sense? She is doing, is basically she is seeing, um, or, or John is seeing um, Ephesians chapter 6, that, is that our warfare is with powers and principalities in heavenly places. Okay? So what this is telling us then is that it's really making a connection here. I want you to ca catch this. Revelation 12, 1, this word heaven, I, if, you, if you want to read it this way, I think it's biblically, biblically accurate. A great sign appeared in heavenly places. A great sign appeared in the spiritual realm. Okay? The woman is pictured, she's on the earth, but she's pictured in the spiritual realm, in spiritual warfare with powers and principalities. Okay, what this, this, this tells me is now Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, the, the Holy Spirit is making a connection here with the book of Ephesians. Because Paul points out in the book of Ephesians, I think it's like five or six times, no, four, uh, four times in the book of Ephesians when, when Paul uses the phrase heavenly places, is talking to, about the spiritual realm. We, our, our warfare is with uh, demons in heavenly places. Is we've been seated with Christ in heavenly places. We have uh, every spiritual blessing belongs to us in Christ in heavenly places. He's talking about the spiritual realm, which is the spiritual realm is that place where there's demonic and angelic activity. It's that, it's that spiritual realm. We, there's a whole spiritual realm around us that we can't see, but that's where, that's where the warfare is taking place. That's where angels and demons are waging war. And, you know, the, the result of that is on the earth, but this is John is seeing this woman in the spiritual realm. Now, I want to make a connection here between Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, and the book of Ephesians. Because let me read Ephesians chapter 3. Are you with me? Is this making sense? Okay. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Th this is a huge point here. You've got to catch this. Is Paul is unveiling the eternal uh, purpose of God, and John, uh, Paul says, Blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. These are not material blessings. These are not prosperity. Not that God's against you having money. This is not about you getting a car or a house, though God does bless his children who seek first his kingdom. It's not about that. These are spiritual blessings where are those spiritual blessings? They are in heavenly places. They're spiritual, so they're in heavenly places. They're in the spirit realm. Um, in Christ. So what Paul is saying here is you have in Christ every spiritual blessing. I'm going to walk through these in a minute, but I just want you to see that's, that's really... And where are, there, where are those spiritual blessings? Heavenly places in the spirit realm in Christ. They're, they're accessed in the spiritual realm through your spirit, not through your physical body, all right? It's talking about really what you, what you could say it like this is you, this is talking about your position in Christ. This is talking about what's available to you in Christ, but what, what I think you're going to see here in a minute is, is the position, our position in Christ and our condition in Christ are very different. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in heavenly places, but the church maybe walks in one fraction of that spiritual blessing. And God wants to close the gap between our position in Christ and our condition in Christ, between who we are in Christ because of what Christ accomplished and who we are by experience through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, bringing us into the experience of what Paul talks about. Okay, are you with me on that? So these are spiritual blessings. They are accessed in the spiritual realm 
as we are filled with the Holy Spirit and, and the Holy Spirit makes those real in our spirit, and we'll walk through that in a minute. And so what Paul is, or what, what John is telling us here in Revelation chapter 12, 1, is these, uh, these spiritual blessings, what, what John is seeing here is he's seeing the church in her heavenly position, not in her condition. Not in your, I'm going to explain that in a minute. But he sees her in her position in Christ as Paul revealed in the book of Ephesians, seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above all rule and power and dominion. We have been raised up with him. We have been raised and we're made alive. We have been uh, forgiven and redeemed. We are, we are called to be made holy. We are called to, we have access to God before, uh, by the Spirit of God before the Father. We have all these incredible blessings but unfortunately, much of the church just camps out at this position in Christ instead of going into the experience of it by the Spirit. And so what John is seeing in Revelation 12:1 is the woman as God sees her in Christ, not as she is in experience, not as she is in reality. This will become clear in a minute. I keep saying that, but it will, hopefully. Hopefully. See, what, what John is seeing is he's saying this, the, the blessings we have in Christ, our status in Christ, our inheritance in Christ, our spiritual victory in Christ, our authority in Christ, bold and confident access to God through the Spirit, our ability to move into mature sonship and to come into the fullness of the overflowing blessing that's in Christ, the ability to know God and to know his love by experience, not just by position. See, if you want to know what God wants to do in your life, he wants to take who you are in Christ and who you are in experience, and he wants to close that gap so that you come into the reality of every spiritual blessing that is in Christ Jesus, that is purchased for you on the cross, that is now actualized into your real, uh, your real life by faith through the Spirit working in you. So many Christians live far below their, the spiritual blessings that are theirs freely in Christ because they live in the flesh and not in the spirit. And they don't believe what, what Jesus Christ has accomplished on the cross. They just think, well, we'll just wait to get to heaven to experience these. You can experience many of these now. And that's what's being highlighted in 12.1 is God seeing the church in his full thought. God seeing the church with the end in mind the beginning, he's seeing the, the, the church with the end in mind. He's seeing the end from the beginning, showing us this is what God's going to bring the church into in the last three and a half years. Okay. Now let's talk about who is the woman. What, who does the woman represent? Well, if we're going to figure out who the woman is, some people would immediately turn to the Old Testament and say, well, the woman is Israel. I, I talked about last, last week why I don't think the woman is Israel. Others would turn immediately to the New Testament and say, okay, the woman is this, this or that or represents this or that. But I think before we go to the Old Testament or the New Testament, we should just go straight to the book of Revelation. That's kind of the rules of interpretation here is we want to go to the immediate context of the book. How does the author use this particular sign or symbol in that book or in the surrounding verses near it before we move out to other chapters and other parts of the Bible? So if we do this and we look at the book of Revelation, we see four women. We see Jezebel. We see the harlot Babylon. We see Jezebel in Revelation 2, uh, 20 through 23. We see the harlot Babylon. We see in Revelation 17 and 18. We see the wife of the lamb made ready in Revelation 19, 7 through 8. And then we see the new Jerusalem who comes down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So we know, we can look at the, you can look at the text, the woman is clearly not Jezebel or the harlot Babylon. So the woman is likely the bride who is going to be made ready. Or you could just make it really simple. The woman represents the church. And we're seeing, John is showing us the church. John sees the church in her position in Christ, but not in her condition in Christ. But there is a remnant within her with whom she is pregnant with, that have come into the full experience of their position in Christ. These are the overcomers. 
These are the mature sons. See, we got to understand this, this principle, this, uh, this principle of son placement is we inherit based upon our maturity. Only sons inherit, even though all the inheritance belongs to them when they're a child. Only sons who've come into maturity inherit. Only those who have come, who've moved out of immaturity to maturity, share in the spiritual inheritance of, the, of that which is rightfully there. So what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 12, the church, the majority of the church, is in her position in Christ, in, in spiritual places, in heavenly places, in the spiritual realm, but only a remnant within the church has come into maturity. Only a remnant within the church has overcome so as to enter into the experience of what Paul said is freely available in the book of Ephesians. Does that make sense? It's going to become more... More important, it's going to be more clear as we get um, on in this. Okay. So let's, let me talk about this. Is the church's position, we're back to Revelation 12.1. The church's position in Christ in the spiritual realm refers to how God sees the church based upon his eternal blueprint and the sovereign work he will do to accomplish his ultimate intention. God sees the end from the beginning. That's what we're seeing in Revelation 12 on. We're seeing the end from the beginning. She's not in that condition. That's her position. And let me just read this scripture in Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Isaiah, the Lord prophesied, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring, listen, declaring the end from the beginning. God works by declaring the end from the very beginning. He works from the end back to the beginning to accomplish what he set out and purpose to do. So we're seeing in Revelation 12, 1, we're seeing the end. We're seeing the end. We're seeing God's end in mind. The Lord says, because he is sovereign, he can say with confidence, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God's sovereign will, God's sovereign plan, Revelation 12, 1, will be accomplished. It just depends on us. Do we say yes and yield to him and allow him to do his work? Okay, the reason, the reason I say in Revelation 12, 1, the woman is, we're only seeing the woman in her position, not in her condition, not who she is by experience, is in Revelation 12, verse 6, where John says the woman flees into the wilderness and she is, she is nourished for uh, 1,260 days. That word nourished in the Greek, what this word nourished means is to be uh, nurtured. She's, uh, it, it's actually used in the context of caring for someone, especially in the context of raising or nurturing children. So what John is telling us in Revelation 12, 6, is that the woman, is God, God's going to bring her into a place of protection in the last three and a half years and he's going to nurture her. He's going to raise her up to maturity in those last three and a half years. It's the exact same thing we see in uh, Hosea chapter 2 where, is, where God's going to bring Israel into the wilderness and he's going to betroth her to himself in the wilderness. He's going to do a work of preparation in her in the wilderness and he's going to do that work in the wilderness. Okay, Hopefully you're with me. I think people are zoning out. Come back, come back, come back. Okay. It, it, again, it's super, super important. But so what, that's what I'm saying. The position in Christ in the spiritual realm versus the condition in Christ based on experience. The, the, the woman, is, we're, you're, seeing, you're, seeing God, you're seeing God's view of the church, what he's going to do versus the woman pregnant with those who have come into the reality of the full experience of the new covenant spiritual blessings that are in Christ. Okay, so now let's talk about the sun. What does the sun represent? 
The sun represents the glory of Christ. The woman is clothed with the glory of Christ. This reveals that the church is glorious in Christ. She is glorious in Christ. God, who sees the end from the beginning, sees the church as glorious in Christ because he will surely make her glorious um, in reality before the Lord's second coming. The moon under her feet represents spiritual authority. The idea being that, you know, Jesus said, all, all, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus Christ has authority in heaven. The woman with the moon under her feet is showing us the church having dominion and authority. But that dominion and authority is only in Christ because authority is only experienced or authority is only truly given through overcoming. Just as, just as inheriting is only come through over, uh, received by maturing, Authority is only given by overcoming. We see that in Revelation chapter 2. If you overcome Jezebel, I will give you a rod of iron. We've got to overcome to have authority. We've got to overcome to have authority. And so the woman having this, this authority over, is showing her position in Christ, but God is going to bring her into the, to the reality of that in the last three and a half years. The woman is wearing a crown of 12 stars. That, that crown is the word Stephanos in the Greek. It's the victor's crown. It's the overcomer's crown. It's the crown given, just like in the Olympics, when you win uh, the contest, you get a gold medal. The overcomers who, who are wearing the crown, they get that by victory. And in this picture, because she, you're seeing her in her position in Christ, you're seeing that she's wearing this crown because of her victory in Christ but she's going to have the crown individually as, as she overcomes in the last three and a half years. But again, there, there's a remnant within her womb who is overcoming as first fruits. They are the ones who overcome first. I want to be one who overcomes first. How about you? You don't have to just be one who, is, who, who, who must wait for that last three and a half years to overcome. No, God right now is calling for overcomers. God is calling for overcomers who come into the reality, who come into the experience, who come into the living expression of all that God has for them. And so then we also see that she has 12 stars on that crown. She's given authority by overcoming, 12 being representative of authority. She's given that authority by overcoming. Now, I just wanted, what I want to do here is just, just to really drill into this because it, it's so important what we're seeing here is we're, to summarize this, is we're seeing the church in Christ in 12.1. We're seeing that, that the church is glorious. She's clothed with the sun and victorious, wearing the victor's crown in Christ. The church has all authority in heaven and on earth, symbolized by the moon under her feet. The very authority that Christ received at his resurrection. The, the church is an overcomer wearing the victor's crown. She, is over, she will overwhelmingly conquer because Christ has won the victory. Revelation 12.1 is showing us the church in her position in Christ before the great tribulation. Okay, now, let me just, let me just talk about now the spiritual blessings um, in the book of Ephesians. Because th this is going to come into play in, in more detail in a minute, but in the book of Ephesians, Paul tells us that God has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ in heavenly places. Now, what, what Paul reveals in the book of Ephesians is that these are available, but not everyone receives them. And then number three, he shows us that to receive them, we must have maturity. That's why God, number four, gives us five-fold ministry who brings us into the maturity that's required to inherit all that God wants to give us. Now, if you just read through the book of Ephesians, or I guess what I want to say this, is in the book of Ephesians, Paul is showing us that he's revealing in the book of Ephesians, this is your position in Christ, but it's not necessarily your condition in Christ. Therefore, this gap between your position in Christ and your condition in Christ by experience, by the Spirit bringing you into this, must be closed. That's really the, 
the, the, the theme of this. And I just want to, in the notes, you can read these in more detail, but I just want to walk through in, in Ephesians chapter 1 some of the incredible blessings that are part of every spiritual blessing in Christ in heavenly places. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says that we are called to be holy and blameless. There's an invitation to you that you can be holy and blameless. It's as sure as done if you will say yes to God and go wholeheartedly in obedience to what he wants you to do. There's an invitation to be placed as a mature, as a mature son into the inheritance of Christ, Ephesians 1.5. There is a blessing of redemption and forgiveness in Jesus Christ in 1.7. There is the opportunity to have a life-changing revelation of God's eternal purpose seen in, in Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. There is a spiritual inheritance available, which we can experience in part now through the indwelling Holy Spirit. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption in 1.13. You have access to a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation so that you have the ability to know him and experience. I'm just trying to lay this out for you so you can see the vast blessings that are available to you and you can also gauge your condition with, with what Paul is laying out of what's freely available. 118 is you can have your heart enlightened to know his eternal purpose or his heavenly calling. 118, you can have the privilege of becoming God's inheritance in the saints. In 119, you have the, the, the ability to access the surpassing greatness of his power in you if you believe. See, all of these blessings, they're available to you in Christ. These reveal your position in Christ. But it takes faith to actualize these blessings. It takes faith to actualize these blessings. If you don't believe that God has these available to you, you'll never walk in them. If you live in your flesh because these are spiritual blessings, you will never receive them, even though they're freely available to you. See, God wants to actualize these blessings that Paul lays out in the book of Ephesians, that you would move from your position into this experiencing of these blessings in reality. God is going to have a people at the end of the age. God is raising up a people at the end of the age who will come into the full experience of these things. I want to be part of those who come into that full experience of these things. Chapter 2. As Paul says, you have been made alive. You've been raised from the dead and made alive in Christ. 2.6, he says, you have um, been raised up with Christ and seated with him in heavenly places. You have the victory and you have been raised from the dead spiritually. You have the victory and the authority in Christ. That's your position. He says he's got good works for you to, to walk out, which God prepared beforehand. Ephesians 2.10. He says, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ, Ephesians 2.13. He said, you've been grafted into the commonwealth of Israel, Ephesians 2.12. You have access to God through one spirit. See, you, listen, uh, that's Ephesians 2.18. You have access to God. God who sits on the throne, you have direct access to him. And a lot of times, a lot of believers just don't live in that reality. Through unbelief and busyness and just distractions and whatever it would be, living in the flesh, compromise. We don't live in that reality, of, but we have access, bold, confident access to God through one spirit, uh, through one spirit, the Holy Spirit. We are a living stone in God's spiritual house. Chapter 3, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, 3.6. 3.6, we are a vital member of his body. 312, we have bold and confident access to God. Again, he's stressing this. The blessings we have, the blessings, not just to stay in our position, not just to stay in this place where this is who we are in Christ. No, God wants to move you from your position to your condition through experience, through actualization, where these become real in you by faith. I hope, hope this is challenging to see how far below I mean, it's challenging me. How far below I'm living from what's available? Ephesians 3, 16 and 17, a strong spirit where Christ dwells in your heart by faith. 
See, God wants us to be these spiritual people who have Christ dwelling in their heart by faith. 319, the opportunity to be rooted and grounded in the love of God through experience. See, what Paul is saying is he's telling us, is he's laying out to us, is you can experience the love of God. Not just know it in your head, but experience, walking in that experience with him. See, are, are you really experiencing these things? This is your position in Christ, but are you experiencing these blessings? Are you accessing these blessings spiritually from heavenly places in the spiritual realm into your spirit to enter into the fullness of these blessings? 320, you have the, the indwelling Holy Spirit. He can do more than you can ask, think, or imagine. 413 is you have the invitation to know Christ by deeply by experience, not just to know about Christ, not just to know the history about Christ, not just to know the facts or the theology about Christ, to know Christ by experience, to commune with him, fellowship with him, know him. The possibility to become a mature man, to grow up into him who is ahead, Jesus Christ, 4.13. 4.13, the offer, oh, this is beautiful, the offer to have the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. Not just a tiny measure, but fullness. Not just a tiny little uh, drop of Christ. Not just a seed of Christ, but the fullness of Christ. 4.13, the invitation to grow up into him who is the head, Jesus Christ. 4.15, a vital role to play in Christ's body. 4.16, Ephesians 4.24, a new spirit. We've talked about this in Indwelling Life. Created in the likeness of God, in righteousness and holiness of the truth. What part of you are you living from? Are you living from this old Flesh corrupted by deceit? Are you living from the new part of you that is already holy, already righteous, and already Christ-like? Do you see how, I hope this is drilling into us, what, what John is pointing out in Revelation 12, 1. He's showing us this is the church in her position, but it's not the church in her condition. Paul is telling us in Ephesians uh, the book of Ephesians, this is your position in Christ. These are all of the blessings available to you in Christ. But what is your condition? How much have you experienced? Because God wants to raise up and God is in fact forming in the womb of this church the overcomers who are coming into the living reality by experience of all these blessings Paul lays out for us in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. Chapter 5, the ability to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily. Don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit every single day. You don't have to be filled with yourself and your sin. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 25 through 32, you have been betrothed to Christ as his bride. Ephesians 5, 26 through 27, you have the opportunity if you say yes and, and, and submit to God your will to be fully sanctified, to be fully cleansed, to be fully made holy and blameless. That's your position. That's the invitation. That's the offer. But it's not necessarily your condition or your experience. I hope, I hope you're being challenged by this to be like, God, I'm living so far beneath what I could be living in. Lord, I am living so far below what is freely available. God, I want to experience and enter into the fullness of the new covenant. I don't want to just wait and so I go to heaven to experience these things. No, I must experience these fully now. God will have a people. 
the overcomers who will come into that before this great tribulation takes place. They're called the first fruits. They're the ones who've come into maturity before the majority. They're the ones who've come into the fullness of this by the Spirit of God before the majority of the church. The majority of the church at the, at the start of the great tribulation will be like we see in Revelation 2 and 3. Lukewarm. Have they have lost their first love. They're entangled in false doctrine. They're entangled in the influence of Jezebel, the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of the age. They are apathetic, indifferent, lukewarm. Well, you're being negative. No, I'm just being truthful. That's just exactly what Jesus said. They're going to be in this condition. The majority of the church will be in that condition three and a half years before the Lord returns. But God will have a first fruits. God will have a free will offering. God will have bond servants. God will have the overcomers who have been formed in obscurity and in hiddenness into the very image of Christ and come into the maturity of being a son of God and now into that mature place of growing up in him. They're able to inherit. They're able to experience all that Jesus freely offered us. Before he returns. We're living far below what God wants. And it's through getting ready. It's through maturity. It's through overcoming. It's through putting the flesh to death. It's by living in the spirit, by the spirit, and his power and his might that we begin to walk in these spiritual blessings where we're coming into sonship. We're coming into maturity. We're coming into Christ's likeness. We're growing up into him who is the head. You with me? These blessings are yours. These blessings are yours. You can walk in all of them. In fact, I would encourage you to read through these notes and just meditate on them in the book of Ephesians and just be like, oh God, bring me into the reality of these blessings. See, your position in Christ is absolutely secure because of the blood of Christ. Because of the finished work of Christ, your position is secure. Your position is absolutely solid foundation because of what he has done. But your condition, how much you experience, depends on faith. It depends on faith. It depends upon you actualizing it by faith, putting your flesh to death, and living in the reality of these new covenant blessings so that your position and your condition are completely aligned. See, the question for us is the church, we're seeing the church in Revelation 12, 1, as God sees her from the end, from the beginning. We're seeing her as God sees her based on his eternal plan and purpose. We're seeing her based upon the sovereign work God will do at the end of the age. But God, but, but, but the reality of it is the church is in the condition of Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. But all hope is not lost. All hope is not lost because within her womb, she was with child. Emerging from within the womb of the church are the overcomers, those who have come into the full experience of what God had intended from eternity past. And they're not just, uh, they're not just have their position in Christ. They've come into the experience of it by the Spirit and by faith. They've actualized it, and it's now real in their condition. And what God purposed from the beginning is real in their heart and soul. They've taken the spiritual blessings from the spiritual realm, and they put them into their spirit by faith, and they're walking in them in reality. God will have an overcomer that has overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, and God will use this overcoming, uh, this overcoming church like an incredibly powerful army in the day of his power to bring the rest of the church whom God brings into a place of refuge at the last three and a half years to nurture the rest of the church up into maturity. And the question for us is this, which group do you want to be in? God is assembling an army right now. 
God is assembling an army right now. And he's doing exactly what he did in Gideon's army. He's calling, C-U-L-L, calling out, pruning out those who are not in alignment with him. Do you want to be part of this overcoming first fruits harvest God's raising up for the day of his power? Or do you, are you content just to remain in your position in Christ? Or do you want to go into fullness? The condition, you know, in Gideon's day, they had to, they had to bow down and, and lap the water up like a dog to be part of Gideon's army. To be, to be part of God's end time army, we have to sacrifice our free will. That, that's how we get into to God's end time army. It's not about salvation. It's not about whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. This is about are you going to be part of the, the last great move of the Holy Spirit as he raises up a spiritual army in the day of his power. The condition, that, that condition of you know, whether we're going to be qualified or whether we're going to be pruned out is based upon the free will. See, are we going to live for ourselves? Or are we going to be those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes? We say, Lord, I'm offering to you my free will. I'm not living for myself. I want to be your bondservant. I'm not, I could have, I could live for myself and still go to heaven, but I'm in love with you, Lord, and I want to be your bondservant, marked for life to obey you wholly, to obey you fully. Which one are you going to be? See, God is, God is speaking really loud right now. I'm not, I'm not saying just through me, through many others, but he's assembling an end-time army, an Elijah army, an army of power, apostolic power, an army of overcomers. But we've got to understand he will prune out. It's not about whether you go to heaven or hell, but he will prune out those who are not sacrificing their free will to God on the altar and saying, Lord... Here's my free will. Lord, I sacrifice to you what I want, when I want it, how I want it, so that I can be one who follows the lamb wherever he goes, so that I can be your bondservant, a free will offering in the day of God's power. One who doesn't just hear the word. See, we're, we're good to hear the word, except when I have untied shoes. We're good at hearing the word. But how much do we implement of the word that's spoken? How much, how much are we just forgetful hearers who hear but don't do? Or how much are we effectual doers who are taking the word that's spoken, internalizing it here, eating that book, so to speak, internalizing it, and then walking it out in obedience and in practice. See, which group are you in? That's the question. That's the question. I want to, I want to pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, we come to you and we say, yes. We say, Lord, your call is going forth for your army. Lord, your call is going forth for your army. Lord, let us have ears to hear. Lord, let us have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. God, let us have ears to hear what you're saying in this hour to us. Lord, that we could say yes, Lord. We could say yes to your invitation. Yes to your calling, Lord. Lord, I pray that you, we would become free will offerings in the day of your power. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Well, we're going to end the online portion here.